This is it, Critters 2. Let's check it out. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Zoran Hungry Hungry Heifer Gavoyich, and today we continue following the bouncing critter balls with Critters 2, the main course, released in 1988. Oh, the main course. Look, speaking of, look, I got McDonald's fries. Very nice. Oh, there's sauce on my remote. No shot. There was sauce on the back. And I got nuggets with... Honey mustard, honey mustard, some spicy ketchup, and a little burgie, a little burgie, a little White Castle burgie. Critters 2 sees the return of Brad Brown, but without the rest of his family. After the first crite attack, they moved out of Grover's Bend. Brad's returned two years later to visit his grandma for Easter, making Critters 2 one of the few and probably the best Easter set horror film. Much better than Beaster Day, here comes Peter Cotton. Easter? I mean, what the hell is going on here? Scott Grimes reprises his role as Brad, and is joined by a few other returning Critters actors, including Terrence Mann, Lynn Shea, and of course, Don Keith Opper. I knew I was going to be in it, and I was cheap, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> One face that didn't return the same was Sheriff Harv, since M. Emmett Walsh declined to do another Critters movie. Nobody I ever gave us flack about that at all. Man, he's actually right. I'm trying to think of, like... I could have sworn I've seen like a killer bunny, but I don't think I've seen many Easter scary movies. You got a lot of like Independence Day movies, Christmas, Halloween, obviously, <laughs> but never really Easter. He's bothering me a little hmm. bit. Well, maybe he was too busy being stuffed on a couch somewhere. Most of the crew also returned, including producer Barry Opper, but one man who didn't was director Stephen Herrick, since he was off working on Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, taking his place Radical. as McGarris in his directorial <laughs> debut. And surprisingly, Critters 2 was also the first McGarris film on the kill count. The prog rock looking Garris is a genre mainstay who's written and or directed a whole bunch of horror films. His work includes a ton of adaptations of Stephen King works, and he also wrote the script for gateway horror drug, Hocus Pocus. His anthology shows Masters of Horror and Fear Itself That's a classic. collaborate with dozens of legendary directors, and his podcast Postmortem provides countless in-depth interviews with horror icons past and present. Plus, James interviewed him once for Meetup, and vouches that Mick is just as lovely as his hair. Garris wanted a his hair is, for his I was about to say, movie, but Critters 2 was definitely that shit was not nice. Bad. It was everything that's difficult about filmmaking: locations, nights, makeup effects, all these puppets, children, animals. Everything that's tough about making a movie was in this little movie. Garris also punched up the script written by David Tui, best known for writing and directing the Riddick film series. Ooh. Thanks to Garris's input, the film is a lot more comedic than the first one. Oh, the first couple of Riddicks. Maybe even all of the Riddicks are pretty cool. Like Pitch Black, that's pretty cool. Facing its similarities to that other franchise. It was all. Oh yeah, I was about to say, I wonder if this is any better than Gremlins 2. I don't think I've seen Critters 2, but I've seen Gremlins 2. That's a rough one. Always a sequel to a low-budget ripoff of Gremlins, but I think there was a little of that Warner Brothers sense. I think it might be better. Garris may have also added this movie's anti-meat I, ha I have a strange suspicion that this might be better than Gremlins 2. Message, since he himself is a long-time vegan. You've been eating red meat. No, 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 no. no a no, hunch. No, it's the worst thing you could do to that body. I love meat. Bad habit. But even if you don't eat meat, this movie's still got plenty Ooh, burger. of kills. How many people-shaped Easter eggs will be cracked open by the critters? Let's find out and get to the kills. Burger. I got that. It's almost gone. The movie begins with a tasty-looking title card. Oh, leave some room for dessert there, critters. A couple of bounty hunters no. complete a seasonal bounty board milestone when they add this hexapod worm to their pile of puppets. Decapitated I am. <laughs> Yoda. The bounty hunters are revealed to be Ugg and Charlie, and Lee's huh? here too, flying them away from a planet of slime. Are you kidding me? He still hasn't picked a face yet. Lee stays a nothing face until he finds the right self. Kind of cool can't though. Live in the wrong self. Wow, actually very gender progressive for the 80s. Well done. They receive a transmission from Warden Zanti, looking completely different from the first film, because now he's played by Mick Garris' wife, Cynthia. He wanted to be in that movie in the worst way, and he made sure it was the worst way possible for her. 
This claustrophobic woman had to spend over eight hours completely covered in prosthetics Ooh. with her arms... Wait, so this is the same, like, uh, not Punisher. What is it? Hellraiser? That's the Hellraiser looking lady? She looks so different. No shot! Because, hold on, they receive a transmission from Warden Zanti, looking completely different from the first film, because now he's played by Mick Garris' wife, Cynthia. How did that happen, though? The design is so different. That's crazy. Hmm. Yeah. He wanted to be in that movie in the worst way, and he made sure it was the worst way possible for her. This claustrophobic woman had to spend over eight hours completely covered in prosthetics with her arms tied behind her. I mean, she couldn't even see through the eyes, and... They didn't even create fuck that. air holes for her to breathe through her nose and oh, fuck her that. mouth, which are both covered up, and had to create slits. Oh, come on, Mick. I'd never force my wife to wear an uncomfortable mask. Uh, Zorin, what about Predator, Michael Myers, Babyface, right. for They Talk? Okay, well, that didn't count. We were just engaged. Okay, they counted, and I'm sorry. Love your hair. My wife's a red. They find out they failed to exterminate the Krites, so in order to get fully paid, they have to head back to Grover's Bend, Kansas. And they aren't the only one, since Bradley Brown, the lone wolf pyro-loving teenager, is on his way to visit his never-before-mentioned Nana for Easter. <laughs> wow, this family really does send him to do everything on his own. Since it's Easter, they're gonna need some eggs. So good thing we have the ones from the end of the first film. Oh, actually, we've got a whole lot more of them. Josh, make a note of how many eggs. 48 eggs. I just realized that guy, <laughs> that guy is the guy that carried the last movie. <laughs> He's right. Noted. The eggs are found by a non-dread pirate Wesley next to the old budget-friendly brown farm mailbox. No need to see the house, just to uh, pretend it's there. Besides, we get to see a farm when we get to see more of Grover's Bend. The fictional town was built from scratch by production designer Philip Dean Foreman and his team. They took old warehouses used for police target practice and added facades, in addition to fully building a church. It was all done in Valencia, California, which was experiencing the coldest winter on record. It was supposed to be spring and warm and the grass kept dying. Lucky. And so they'd go Lucky. out and spray the grass green. It was so cold, in fact, that their end of filming gift was a pair of wool socks. Embroidered. Oh, that's kind of cool, though. Happy Christmas. The returning Lynn Shay as Sal is... Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. I'd whip those out every Christmas. Those would be like on occasion socks, you know? He's now a reporter for the local newspaper. That's got your name in it, and they look so big and, you know, cozy. And she thinks she's got a big story when she sees Brad Brown coming round to the bend. The head of the paper, Mr. Morgan, says for her to leave the boy alone. That boy's stories nearly tore this town apart. And I guess his parents' and sisters' accounts were ignored too? Cool. Uh, maybe just go back to printing stories about Fonzie. Wesley, that Eric Christian almost guy, heads down under to Quigley's antique shop. He's there to unload some eggs. And for payment, not Buck Flowers here, gives him some generic beer and a couple of Playboys. Wait, is that October 74? Nope, guess we'll never know since he loses one of them on the way out. No. Good job, Wesley. He celebrates his job well done at the Hungry Heifer, a local restaurant with a super catchy jingle created by Cynthia Garris. <laughs> Singer. Man, I don't know why, but something about like a Playboy magazine has never made sense to me. Like, or not like a Playboy. I don't know, is it a Playboy? I think so. You know, I just don't understand the magazine selection. I feel like I'd be better off using my imagination. Like, I've never seen something more boring than a magazine. I don't know. Like, the only magazines I've ever enjoyed is, like, a Game Informer. Or, like, a cooking one. Other than that, man... Oh, actually... <laughs> I just remembered a time... I used to have wrestling magazines for a little bit. And there was a time when Wrestle 20, WrestleMania 25 was happening. And I remember the cover. I remember the people in the book. I remember a page. And I remember taking the, the, the thing to school and encapsulating everyone's attention in that class. What a day. What a day. WrestleMania 25. 
issue. I think it's issue 26. Hold on. I'll, I need to check. This is a. This is an ancient memory right here. This is the one. This is the one. I remember I used to walk. I brought this to school one day. And there was a page someone tried to steal out the book. Man, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. What a book. If you know, you know. Songwriter and space warden? What? If you know, you know. Can't your wife do, Mick? Aside from, you know, breathe in that costume. Why did you do that to her? Wesley hits on a girl named Megan. Like you do. But his advances are unwanted, so Brad intervenes with an interesting fighting stance. Palms up with all the weight on the balls of his feet. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't <laughs> work. He winds up getting his stunt double thrown out of the restaurant in a fun one take that then has Scott Grimes pop up into Megan's truck. While giving him a ride, Megan reminds Brad that they knew each other. Man looked like he was getting ready to like rock climb. He's like practicing his rock climb stance. Work, and he winds up getting Like look at this guy, straight. What the fuck is that? Thumbs up with all the weight on the balls of his feet. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, it doesn't what the work. He winds up that? being a stunt double thrown out of the restaurant in a fun one take that then has Scott Grimes pop up into Megan's truck. While giving him a ride, Megan reminds Brad that they knew each other as kids. She tells him she's now a reporter for her dad's newspaper. Oh, this is a thick nuggy. Man, I love the interactions between Brad and Megan. Even it is so thick. Even if Curtis didn't think the relationship was realistic. Serious You're so thick, no? Ginger boys. I'm sorry, is that rude? <laughs> she Look! takes him to his Nana's daycare slash home, but Grandma's out. She's back over the river and through the woods buying some of those eggs for the church's Easter egg hunt. She haggles for half and awards her little helper Cindy with a bunny, but it's neither milk nor dark chocolate. Oh, it's better than chocolate, honey. It's carob. Carob? Boo! No, not the animal. Why'd you cut that in there, Bree? It's not as common nowadays, but carob was a chocolate substitute used during the natural foods movement in the 70s. The other eggs remain at Quigley's shop, where they're slowly roasted by an open fire until they hatch. Later, Quigley discovers they've eaten all his dog's food. And his dog! Ugh. Why do I keep doing movies with dog deaths? Why? He tries to get off the damn ground, but the critter babies chew through his foot and the stool. It sends him to the floor and onto the count when he's eaten by these chestnuts. The baby- Man, I think dogs Dogs in horror movies? That's just too far. You've taken it too far, man. You've done the dirty. I can't believe you've done this. The critters were very small rod puppets with limited movement. When it came to killing Quigley, they strung monofilament through his shirt and attached <laughs> it to these bitey baby balls. And on cue, we pulled the string and pulled. The one in Gremlins survives, though, so that's pretty cool. Point. That night, Brad looks through promotional materials from the first movie, while Cindy, who happens to be Megan's little sister, stores her Easter egg and carob bunny by the heater. They usually taste better a little melty. That is, if they weren't made of fucking carob! Wow, Satan's raisin. The egg hatches, giving birth to a widow baby camera operator, who playfully tries to eat faux Barrymore's hands and feet. But Dad's foot is the one you should be worried about, as it turns this critter into Nickelodeon <laughs> gag. Well, your Easter candy's real Squish! Yeah. The next day is Easter, and these 30 Helens agree. <laughs> it's like the plankton moment with SpongeBob. Well, your Easter candy's a real mess. Yeah. <laughs> the next day is Easter, and these 30 Helens agree to hide some of those crit Easter eggs all around the churchyard. But the hunt can't begin until after the holiday sermon, which should give those eggs plenty of time to hatch. Yep, there we go. Joining the festivities is Grover's Ben's new sheriff, dressed as the Easter Bunny. Bunny. Well, mostly dressed. Oh, this is great. Easter Bunny with his hatchet be hanging out. He's played by David Erson, previously seen on the kill count in Halloween 5. Sheriff Corwin hops along casually till he finds a hatched egg in a very fun shot. But the fun doesn't last when the critters exceed his suit to ball occupancy limit. He tries to get them out, but ends up somehow that ain't launching right. himself through the church window <laughs> and then succumbing to his bite wounds. Hilariously tragic, but you know, could have been worse. At least he got his fly out. I have no idea where the critters went since the townsfolk chalk this death up to some kind of farm accident. I'm sorry, what? Some kind of farm Wait. accident. Wait, what kind of farming machine rips out a man's <laughs> stomach, seals him back in his clothes, and then... They straight went for his uh, nads, no? Oh, launching himself. Or did they go for his stomach? 
till he finds a hatched egg in a very fun shot. But the fun doesn't last when the critters exceed his Bro! occupant. One of them went in the jimmy. Like, hello? Like, you can't say that's a tractor incident. <laughs> no shot. <laughs> Hilariously tragic, but, you know, could have been worse. At least he got his fly out. I have no idea where the critters went, since the townsfolk chalk this death up to... Some kind of farm accident. I'm sorry, what? Some kind of farm accident. What kind of farming machine rips out a man's stomach, seals him back in his clothes, and then tosses him through a window? I'm sorry, do you people spend your holidays with John Kramer? Oh shit, there he is! Megan convinces Brad to see the retired and recast Sheriff Harv, now played by Barry Corbin. Even though Harv saw the Krites in the first film, this new actor is less than eager to help. This town can kiss my ass! He then just drives off into an empty field, and moments later, the bounty hunters land in a miniature version of that field. Charlie finds Chekhov's Playboy, but before he can read it, for the articles, the non onawana counselor Zug and Lee arrive, Surely. and is told to transform. They use the nearest material for inspiration in a much less melty and much more booby transformation, which leads to a super silly joke I love when Lee replicates the staple in the centerfold. Kill this transformation uh. effect was done by returning special effects artist R. Christopher Biggs. The bladder used to inflate the boobs broke on the day, so Biggs had to improvise, attaching a boom pole to a faux fun bag and manually pushing it out. Bro. Oh. I love that gag, and it's like, I always cringe because it's not the way it was supposed to work. Lee's <laughs> centerfold form was... Bro, I want to see this transition, like... The, the blank turned into woman. Played by Roxanne Kernahan who wasn't officially huh. a Playboy model, but she had done a photo shoot for Playboy that was never used, so that's what you see in the movie. Also, she had to film that nude scene in literally the coldest day in a hundred years. Hey, just wanted to pop in to say that she's also in the decline of Western civilization part two. She's one of the chicks laying around in a bed next to Paul Stanley. That woman was awesome. Yes, she was. And actually, it was very tragic to learn that she passed away from a car accident in 1993 when she was only Jesus. 32 years old. Jesus. Brad and Megan head back to town, where Bro. he gives more dumbass explanations for what happened to the sheriff. Well, it could have been a dog. Brad, that was idiot. wild. Oh, damn well, it wasn't a dog. It was... Man, my brain just got played in like the last four minutes in such a weird way. Oh man, that that was weird. That was weird. Thank you, Lin Shay, dressed like Seance Scam the Lucy. Fuck? And it looks like critters make her so mad, like furry flames on the side of her face, that it's up to Brad to once again go it alone. Dude, just learn to call <laughs> for help. Oh, who are we gonna call? Critter Busters? Good point. I mean, if they're related to the Pin Busters, they ain't gonna do shit. He does a half ass job by knocking once and then giving up. Nobody's home. Let's get out of here. How is that man standing up and opening doors? Whoop, looks like he hurt no me as shot. he collapses onto Brad. The critters then attack, sounding like Sonic the Hedgehog getting a boner. <laughs> they fend off the ballsy Blitzkrieg with Sal challenging one to a duel, while another inflates itself I can hear it. like a Peter Frampton pig on the tire. That doesn't go well when they drive off, as it's squished under the tire, leaving behind a critter cake with extra green syrup. They make it back to Grandma's house, where the octogenarian's been fighting Flat. off a fridge raider of her own. Nana, the critters are here. No shit. God damn, I love Nana. But not in like that way. <laughs> I'm married. Brad finds the bounty remote from the first movie, and when he pushes the Deus Ex button, uh, the so? door and critter explode all over the wall. The bounty hunters are back. These guys are great. Yes, <laughs> yes they are. The reunion continues when Brad sees a clean and sober Charlie. <laughs> oh, that man was so ecstatic he didn't have to fucking 1v20 anymore. Critter explode all over the wall. The bounty hunters are back. These guys are great. <laughs> Straight left his family immediately. These guys are so much better. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> the reunion continues when Brad sees a clean and sober Charlie who loves his new job as a bounty hunter. Guess that means he won't be staying long. I gotta go where the cosmic winds blow me. Cosmic winds? Isn't that the name of a space stripper? The bounty hunters somehow walk to town faster than Brad and Megan can drive there and come across the Hungry Heifer Burger Joint overrun by critters and Eddie Deasons. Deason's career consisted of playing the nerdiest of nerds, most notably in Greece and as the voice of Mandark in Dexter's Mandark! Life. Deason's <laughs> then Iggy Catalpa pulled away, giving us time for another fun Gremlin Z comedy scene. Ritter style. But that fun doesn't last. Is that the blank? Giving us time for another fun. 
Ooh, burger. Is that the blank? <laughs> and Arthur's career can choose like Jesus then. I forgot about this guy from Dexter. <clears throat> What a the goof. Space stripper. The bounty hunters somehow walk to goof. town faster than Brad and Megan can drive there and come across the Hungry Heifer Burger Joint, overrun <laughs> by critters and Eddie Deason's. <laughs> Deason's career consisted of playing the nerdiest of nerds, most notably in Greece and as the voice of Mandark in Dexter's Lab. Deason's then Iggy Catalpa pulled away, giving us time for another fun Gremlin Z comedy scene, Critters style. But that fun doesn't last long since Ugg's dick gun gets aroused by the thought of killing. And Lee here definitely doesn't suffer from penis envy. <laughs> Uh-oh is right, as the humanized Daleks start to exterminate, exterminate. And going off the 14 total I see in this wide shot and the one on the garbage can here, I count 11 critters killed in this scene. Six crites are blown up by the bounty hunter's wing guns on screen, and another is knocked into a fryer after getting a new haircut. <laughs> Four are able to valmorphosize into a larger ball and escape, leaving four to be killed off screen from these ridiculous blasts. Ooh, how do you feel about that number, Critter? <laughs> this movie is a goddamn cartoon and I love it! The fuck? This Kansas chain restaurant massacre took days to film. The meat and ketchup and other food smells got old really quick. Luckily, the Kyotos could take <laughs> out their aggression by exploding some critters. Imagine. Those exploding ones had to be made differently from the normal puppets. We made them out of urethane foam. Yeah. Yeah, so they were more rigid, so you would actually see pieces explode and break apart. Ooh, and what about all those pieces? We would, we would get... Uh, Fake ad! No shot! Minute, blood Hold and on. stuff, and we'd load, load them up. Well, good to know they were practicing safe FX. That's I'm Bovine, owner of the Hungry Heifer, and I'm here to remind all you little critters that this weekend our Easter Feaster deals are back. This weekend only, you can grab yourself a Moosai Shake, a Bonneto Beef, or a basket of Beefster eggs with all the crucifixes. And unlike our Lord Jesus Christ, after three days, these deals won't be resurrected. So come on down to the Hungry Heifer. Unless, of course, you're one of them prison-breaking <laughs> space porcupines. Then stay the hell away. My insurance won't cover that shit no more. At the Hungry Heifer, we won't give you huh? The escape ball chases folks in critter vision, which honestly makes me wonder why they aren't just vomiting all the time. The ball then busts these pinheads. True. Sure. Before 710 splitting up to continue terrorizing the town. And let's just take a moment to point out the unsung heroes of this scene, the extras, who absolutely gave it their all running from these furry bowling balls. <laughs> Bro, that guy's beard. Yeah, you know, that guy looked like the upkeep or uh, you know, the the guy with Woody in the second, no? Furry <laughs> He's the prospect bowling balls. Brad and Megan find her dad, who gets hit by an no? awkward insert shot of a critter quill. The quill peters him out, <laughs> and they drag story. him away, dropping him off at the church before very casually just walking back through town to meet up with the bounty hunters. Good Googling. Trying to figure out how straws work. The hungry heifer Hefe whines about the damage to his franchise location when Lee decides to quantum leap their <laughs> face into the Deezes. No more crates. Okay, they <laughs> try to do just that for a couple of scenes, Wait, but they miss no. all their shots until night falls. No! Right, maybe it's because this new <laughs> face isn't working out for Lee. No! Perhaps the face of a burned what up child fuck? molester would be a better fit? Charlie quickly vetoes that idea since it would break this movie's budget to get Robert England in the height of Freddy Fever. But that, oh, that'd be crazy though. It's okay because Lee reverts back to their previous form and catchphrase. Good googly. They track one of the critters into a totally I mean, that's okay too. Way, but find themselves that's in cool. an ambush situation. Must be a couple of dozen of these things. These screams bring Charlie and I no. running where they find Lee's arm chewed to the bone like a pied to the blank. security guard. Damn, actually, no this tech makes me sad. And I'm not the only one. As a distraught Ugg screams their face away, putting some validity to my... Th oh, wait, he's the... Wait, are they all the boy? ...thought that these two are more than just work friends. Everyone oh. is here in the church since they can't leave town oh. or call for help, thanks to a little critter sabotage. The critters are nowhere to be seen, but they are heard by this shotgun toting fella, who goes to investigate only to be pulled off screen and eaten. Wait, is he really dead? <laughs> I guess Jesus! So. Once again, Brad is I on mean, his own. So it's up. If he wasn't dead, he would have got up and smacked the shit out of that boy. <laughs> Holy fuck! Straight right in the face. I guess so. 
Once again, Brad is on his own. So it's up to him to save Cindy <laughs> He's got as it. she jigsaws and zags her way across a field. Brad bats some critter balls away and then throws away his only weapon in order to hug Cindy. Oh, God damn it, Brad. Right. And just as it looks like they're critter crudite, a mysterious gunman shoots down five critters. But who in the name of Harry Crumb would have done the such prospect. a thing? The prospect! Oh. Well, the character is. You're, you're still a different actor. The critters all attend CritCon 88, and Megan tries to help us with our count. There must be hundreds of them. Well, that's not specific enough. Josh? Oh, that's way more than the 48 eggs from before. It must be a critter orgy or something. That's one horny critter and two horny critter man. The townsfolk blame Brad for the critters returning, but Clay uh -huh. Johnson is the closer of that conversation. If we sit around here on our duffs, bitching, bitching, we're going to end up with Mara's leftovers. And I don't too much relish that idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that was a delicious pun. Relish. Brad comes up with a <laughs> goddamn plan and suggests they lure the critters into the nearby hamburger factory. Then they'll lock them in and blow them up. Sounds good, but where are you going to get the explosives? The hardware store? They're not going to have no any. Shot. What the fuck? What store is this? This is a boom fay of meat what and dynamite that's sure to raise the critters' nitroglyceride levels. With a single fan, they waft the smell over a mile, and somehow it works. No, oh, that was like that was enough explosives to blow up the store. How? No shot. That be a thing. No shot. Perks. The no come shot. Even slow, Jeremy. No <laughs> shot. Uh, I guess they can talk now. No, that's just ridiculous. Unfortunately, the winds change, causing them to go after the live meat. Looks like Charlie. It's time to prove yourself. And you ran away, and that's which. Okay, cool. Our franchise hero, ladies and gentlemen. A larger critter stops them and tells his non manscaped militia they'd be better off with cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburgers! And since the Krite social hierarchy is based on survival of the biggest, they make like Autobots and roll out. This caravan of critters consisted of a grid of lightweight aluminum with wires connecting the critters who were on yokes so they would roll when dragged across the terrain. Well, most of them. The larger critter ball that leads them was on its own yoke and dragged by an ATV off screen. They get to the Polar Ice Burger Factory and chow down on some meat. Man, meat. do they love to eat. <laughs> Look at that little guy. He just couldn't be happier. Unfortunately, the Kyotos weren't too happy that production used real raw meat that would get rancid after a couple days of shooting. They were Ugh. sealed. They were called. Bro, that's got a fucking stink. Down and be all over your hand. And oh, putting those puppets on your hand. They just. <laughs> Stinky little bastards. And when everyone else. No, uh, I got all rancid and shit, so it was probably like sitting there sweating. Wait, it was cold there, no? Maybe it wasn't sweating. I'm just imagining there was juices and shit. Man, that just sounds terrible. Went home for the day. We would have to take that ain't the puppets it. and actually spend that ain't it. cleaning them. Oh, it's not so bad. After some awkward stares, it's revealed that the big critter is actually Ugg in disguise. He then transforms and escapes oh. just in time for the door to crush another critter. Oh, he looks like a fuzzy little Tatum. The townsfolk, Wily e. Coyote the Plunger, blowing up the factory and melting. Wait, so he can turn into a critter? What the fuck? Wait, he could have like, he could have planted a bomb. I mean, he did lure them, but like, he could have just, you know, he could have soloed, no? The polar icebergers. This effect was originally supposed to be three giant explosions, so that it would top the ending from the first film. The first explosion burned up all the wires that were going to detonate the explosions to follow. You can't do take two once you've already exploded take one. Oh well, it still makes for a very happy ending. Brad and Megan celebrate with a kiss as I start counting... Absolutely nothing! Because those critters are Oh dead. shit, this is the ball bonanza. They formed one of the greatest things to ever be filmed. <laughs> what the fuck? A giant critter ball. The critter ball was originally scripted to be 30 feet in diameter. When that proved too difficult, it was scaled down to 10 feet. Which that's was still huge. That's huge. crazy. The ball was built on a geodesic dome structure, then covered with critter heads and fur. Some of them are <laughs> seeing their butts and their, their bodies. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Parts. Like Scary. Faces on. Yeah. Dangerous. Oh, did you hear that, Josh? Cool. Wait, wait, what? Oh, I lost count. The critter heads had remote controlled mouths to add movement, but the real movement UAV. that mattered was moving this giant thing around. They first tried mounting a bar into a center axle and rolling it on the off camera side, but that was unreliable when going over rough terrain and also crushed the whittle critter faces. Mr. Keanu, oh, how no. did you say the test worked out? I think it 
sucks balls. Special effects supervisor Martin Breslin fixed the issue by mounting the ball on a trailer so it could be towed. For some wide shots, they used a full-size ball that was actually a weather balloon covered in critter pelts. It would either be rolled by a crew member. One time it got away from us and rolled down into the canyon. We had to go mm -hmm. get it. Or pulled by an ATV, <laughs> which Charlie Kyoto loved to watch. Seeing a crowd of people running. <laughs> and this giant furry ball is being pulled <laughs> and is chasing them along. It was a hoop. The critter ball runs over one oh. slow-ass motherfucking extra. That's gotta be pretty nice to sit on. It's all fuzzy. You can use it like as a chair, or a couple people could use it as a chair. ...who leaves behind a cartoony shaking skeleton. Oh! Just, you know, sitting on top of his old clothes. What the fuck? Yeah, best way to go out is pantsless. And that effect was a happy accident. During one of the takes, somebody bumped the foot, and the whole skeleton kind of went... And <laughs> Ooh, do more of that. <laughs> the gym class push of death chases the Grovers back to town with Megan and Brad in tow. The chase that follows involved the truck mounted critter ball trying to ram them off the road. It was difficult and nerve wracking to film. Having it pound against without ruining anything, very expensive device for what we were doing. And that goes for the actors as well. It's very distracting to work with a giant critter ball to the left of you. The ball and Edward Kyoto arrive in town. Fair. You see my legs. I'd be poking it. Where it heads straight towards the church it. to consume midnight mass quantities. Brad and Megan are able to cut it off, but then you know send their car over a hay bale. And that doesn't do much since they're still able to get to the church on time. The critter ball turns back on course for the church when, oh my god, is that Charlie flying the spaceship? Everybody hunter! Yay, Charlie's going no on an adventure! Shot. And that's apparently the greatest adventure, death as he flies into the critter ball, blowing it up and adding, uh, yeah, how many critters do we add to the count, Josh? I started to go cross-eyed from counting, so I'm gonna use math. Assuming the center is hollow like an Entheran ball. Eighty-seven. Well, I estimated a 16 critter diameter, giving us an eight critter radius, so. Oh, wait. Uh, wait, he's right. It's pretty big, actually. Hold on. Is it? Uh, hold on now. Hold on. Oh, our surface area would be four times pi times eight squared, which is around 804 crit. That can't be right. I feel like I was closer, no? Damn, very impressive. Let's add 804 critters to the bounty board that died in this goodness gracious great. He's fucking uh, he's trying to for it. All the fire. With Charlie presumed <laughs> dead, the town mourns Straight and Hunter honors it. him by taking his face. But the next day, as Brad is saying his goodbyes and almost kissing Megan again, they learn that Charlie survived by ejecting himself from the spaceship before it blew up. Totally did oh, not see anything fly out of that ship, but hey, gotta keep him around <laughs> for the third film. With Ugg's grand facial gesture made moot, he returns to a random spaceship, leaving Charlie behind. Charlie is then declared the new sheriff by the ex-sheriff, who definitely has no authority to do such a thing. Brad and Megan finally kiss, and the True. movie ends with the filmmakers thanking the fictional folks of Grover's Bend. How many people became the main course in this Easter Sunday meal of a movie? Let's find out and get to the no- Oh god, critters! Oh, bounty hunter, save me! No, oh, save me! That was a lot. Oh, there was a lot of critter deaths, no? Hey, was that James? Life signs not detected. Show must go on. Wait, is he back? Oh. Count more crites. the numbers. I thought he was almost back. Keep on counting. Four humans and one alien bounty hunter died in Critters 2. They were all men, except for my friend Lee. Giving us a chart as blue as the frozen meat from the hungry heifer. Ha 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 joke. With a runtime of 94 minutes, <laughs> good one. Gave us a kill on average every 18.8 .8 minutes. Yeah, and not not many human kills, but they went off on the little little shitters. For the bounty board, we can add 824 dead crites, seven for the townsfolk, and 817 for the bounty hunters. We win. That leaves us with a critter kill on average every seven-ish seconds. Hmm. 
This form is Damn. pleasing yet goofy. Now, if I could just get the voice right. Wait, can you turn into the lady? <clears throat> I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kills to the guy run over by the critter ball. Where'd it's he the go? Most memorable kill from the movie, and so yeah, that was pretty cool. So cartoony and fun. It's just I, I fucking love it. The old machete for lamest kill goes to this rando shotgun guy yeah. pulled off screen. The most horrifying thing about that was the damage done to my eardrums <laughs> by <laughs> this motherfucker. Brat. And the Bounty Booty Award for Best Critter Kill goes to the Critter Ball. Because how the hell could I not? And that's it. Critters 2 came out in 1988, and due to its poor box office performance, was the final Critters film to be released theatrically. It Damn. performed well enough on home video to prompt two back-to-back -back film sequels that I'll be starting next week. But until then, I'm a man who also loves a girl named Megan, and this has been The Kill Count. Damn. Well, that was crazy.